Well, good morning, everyone. I'm very excited to kick off this next panel. Uh, cards on the table. I am a Floridian by heart. I have Florida woman in all of my social media bios. I was born in Orlando. I grew up in, in this beautiful state. Went to the University of Florida, go Gators. Um, but now I live in Washington, DC. And so I am now sort of coming to this conversation as a moderator of this debate between Florida and California, a little bit as an outsider. Um, but I'm excited to have two very able panelists to join me today to walk through uh, which one of these states, or maybe the answer is neither or both, is a better place for tech, for innovation, and for what's next. So my two panelists today, uh, first all the way on uh, my left, your right, is Mike Solana. He is a vice president at Founders Fund and editor-in-chief at Pirate Wires. And then we have Chairman Daniel Perez, who is a, are you speaker designate designate? For the next month. Uh, long story short, in Florida, they choose who's going to be the speaker of the state legislature, uh, the state house, like years in advance. And he has been, the sorting hat has chosen him. So uh, we're thrilled to have you here uh, as well to, to defend Florida. Um, but Mike, I'll start with you on this question. Uh, how did California initially become the innovation hub that it was? How did Silicon Valley get born, and to what extent are those conditions still in play? Um, okay, so I mean, years ago, you had a series of like sort of mini industries, all of them tech related, that uh, in confluence with money from uh, investors and lots of talent from the schools, sort of came together and created this great ecosystem for companies. And once you had a first, once you had your first sort of few huge companies, it attracted more talent and the flywheel began. Um, no one else was doing it. It was like this sort of runaway monopoly. There was money in Boston, but like over time, Silicon Valley kind of became it. Uh, and it became impossible to beat, really. Before we get like super into it, I do want to say it's like sort of strange to be on the California side. Most of what I've done over the last two years is criticize California, so I'll be as fair as I can. <laughs> you don't have to take the California side, by the way. There's no points awarded at the end if, if California wins or you lose, so don't worry about that too much. Well, so Danny, I then want to ask you, what are the things that Florida can most easily replicate about what California has done right over the last couple of decades? The answer to that is going to be extremely limited uh, because I do think that Florida has been doing more right than California, and not just as of late. I think just historically across the board. But the one common response that I've gotten when I've spoken to people um, in the tech space, when I say, hey, I'm, not a, I'm a healthcare guy. I'm an attorney for a healthcare company. That's what I do. That's what I do for a living. What can I do to help the tech space in Florida? The one common uh, response that I've always received, which Mike just finished hitting on, was the higher education space. It's tough to, to get the talent pool in Florida that California is receiving, and it's because of the investment in higher education specific to the tech space that California has, has, has put into their market. So uh, that's what I would love to, to kind of have in Florida, which is the higher education focus towards technology so that we can have the talent created here, but also remaining here instead of them picking up and moving uh, and leaving to California. So yeah, can I, can Mike, I yeah, go ahead. I, well, I just want to say that it's not sufficient to be doing to be sort of like doing better than California, because California, the, the thing that's happening is California doesn't actually have to do anything to succeed. It's like so many resources, so many smart people, so many powerful companies, um, so much money that it's just like a, a really hard, it, it's like, it's really hard to fuck it up. And that's why they've been able to persist so terribly for so long in terms of politics. And this is sort of like, I think it's a, a very good, the analogy would be actually America. America's like, you know, you have no sort of, n no, uh, no serious border threats uh, from other foreign countries. You're separated from the rest of the world by these two giant oceans. We have unlimited resources. We have like runaway uh, successes in all of our companies. It's hard, it's hard for us to lose. And so our bar for, for competent government is like the, the bottom of the bottom. Like we just don't need it to be that good to still survive. And, and that's what you're, you're up against with California is like, they're, yeah, they've sucked for decades and decades, but they sucked even you know decades and decades ago. So it, it's like you just need, I think you really need, uh, more important than even education is you need just lots and lots and lots of engineers. Um, I don't know that you necessarily even create them. I think it's like you need good companies. And once you have a few huge companies in Miami, that will be, be sufficient um, because those engineers will leave, they'll build new things and, and, st and stuff like that. Is, is there any advice that either of you would give to 
potential future University of Florida President Ben Sass uh, about what it would take to make a school like Florida competitive with the Berkeleys, with the Stanfords that you have out in California? Look, part, part, of the, part of the problem with having the companies come to Florida from California when we're talking about uh, the, the tech space is they're saying, well, I, I, if I'm in California, although the environment and the climate for my business is terrible, uh, at least I know I can go to 10 schools that I can find the talent necessary. If I come to Florida, yes, I can bring it to a, a friendly business climate, but I just can't find the talent. Uh, and so I, I think, you know, if we can have that talent here at the University of Florida, Florida State, FIU, FAU, any of our schools, um, then, then I think it would be a little bit easier to bring some of these, these companies that we've been trying to lure for a while. I think Senator Sass is, is in a, a, a position where he can have tremendous influence. The University of Florida is the fifth best uh, university as far as state schools are concerned in the entire country. Uh, we're one of the highest, uh, higher one of the highest rated higher education um, states in the entire country. And we've invested in that for, for many, many years, uh, but not so much into the tech space, which has recently changed. And I think President Sass is going to have the opportunity to grow up upon that. I just don't think that's it's great. And you definitely, if you can build up the tech talent at the school level, that's amazing. But there are great engineering schools across the country, um, in Illinois, in Boston, in uh, you know, at Carnegie Mellon. And none of those places, in Boston also, Boston not only has the talent, but it has a thriving venture ecosystem, and still they can't compete with San Francisco. Uh, so it's like you, you're just going to need, you definitely do need the, the schools. It's, it's a great ad. I just don't think it's the main thing. Um, and also neither is venture. I think the really, the weird thing, it's like you just need a huge company here in addition to those things. So my next question then is about our previous panelist, uh, Miami Mayor Francis Suarez. Uh, famously at the end of 2020, uh, in response to a tweet about, hey, can we move Silicon Valley to Miami, said, hey, how can I help? Um, and a lot's been made of that. But I'm, I'm curious to know to what extent has it actually led to action that has, like, what, to what extent has it actually meant something beyond a tweet? Or, or is it a tweet enough? Is the marketing enough? Can I? So my colleague uh, Delian actually tweeted the thing that Suarez yeah. responded to, and I would say that w what it was, what was really important is, so like I, I don't know that Suarez necessarily did m much on his end to make any of what followed sort of happen, but just being positive and sort of saying like, hey, like I don't hate you, was for someone from San Francisco like a shock. I mean, people in the tech industry in, in California were used to being loathed for all of the successes and all of the money that we drew and all of the resources that we drew to the area. And to just have someone sort of acknowledge reality and say, oh no, actually we love that and we would love that here was enough for a lot of people in tech, Delian included, Keith Raboy included, uh, to sort of come out to, to, to the spot and, and give it a chance. And, and I think they, and also entrepreneurs who are now building here, other venture capitalists who have moved here, there are venture capitalists, you know, obviously previously uh, them as well. I think, I think that is all, th that all is, is very important and people are doing things here. And I think that his like attitude, his receptive attitude was, was a, a big part of sort of choosing Miami for a lot of these people. Yeah, I'm going to chime in as well. I'm from Miami, so I, I was raised here. Uh, my wife, I met her here. My, my kids are going to be raised in Miami. Um, Miami, in my opinion, is the most beautiful city in the entire world. I don't ever want to leave Miami. Uh, it is a unique place. But what people forget, and this is just like a government 101 uh, talk, is the city of Miami is, is this little. Uh, and, and there are many cities within the county of Miami-Dade County. Miami-Dade County is a juggernaut. It's the real deal, and it is a powerful county. Um, it's the largest county that we have in, in the state of Florida. But even then, the state of Florida is the umbrella to all of that. It's the umbrella to all 67 counties and all cities. The, the true opportunity for a city, like the city of Miami, to flourish and to have, a, uh, have people like uh, Delian move over from California to Florida, it, it starts with the government structure and the policies that we're passing in Tallahassee on behalf of the entire state. That is what is allowing people to say, hey, my business is better off in Florida, Miami, Jacksonville, it, Polk County, it doesn't matter, than San Francisco. Lowest unemployment rate, 2.7% amongst the top 10 most populous states in the entire country. Uh, our budget, half of California's. What does that mean? We're taking less from people that live in Florida in comparison to California. I'm a Dolphins fan, big football guy. Tyreek Hill chose the Dolphins over the Jets. He would have paid this season, he would have paid 
probably two and a half million dollars more if he would have gone to the Jets and if he would have stayed with the Dolphins. The reason that he chose us amongst many, I'm sure that matters. Two and a half million dollars is real money. That was my next question because he literally gave that as a response he, he, in a question in an interview. He, 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 he two he words, state taxes is he, why I am a Dolphin and not a Jet. He, he, he did, and it's important. I tell people that, that he tweeted that because that is what allows people to say, man, I'm done with San Francisco. I'm done with California. Uh, look, I think Mayor Suarez uh, did a great job by tweeting uh, how may I help you, uh, but but the truth is uh, the, the city of Miami is, is is a very small part of what the state is able to do, and we've been able to show that through COVID, through the hurricane. Uh, I mean, the governor deserves a lot of credit. Governor DeSantis deserves a lot of credit for that, and I don't want that to go unnoticed uh, when we're talking about the comparison of a tweet to actual policies that allow businesses to flourish. Well, and, th and that was going to be my next question: is a lot of this conversation comes down to taxes. California has so many taxes. Florida. Effectively, no, you know, no income taxes. But there's got to be other things in the policy environment that can either make or break an innovation sector. Mike, yeah, tell me a little I, bit. I actually don't think taxes has much to do with why people are moving. I think it's an e it's like an, a nice bonus that you, that you add to the checklist and, and you move. But people have lived in California throughout their entire career um, or New York State or, or something like that. And it's because there's so much there. So I think what's actually happening, it's like people aren't moving because suddenly taxes are too insane. They're moving because life in the actual cities was too insane. It was like crime was insane, education was insane, transportation was insane, the drug problem, especially in places like San Francisco and Los Angeles, I can't really speak to, to the others, uh, like New York as, as much, I didn't live there, but like it was really, really, really bad. And under COVID especially, you just sort of felt like, like your government was like at war with you and you were spending all of this money. So that is what made the, I think, the exit easier. It was an easier, it was an easier choice and it was like, oh, and also we get all this money. Now, that having been said, Florida is going, I think Florida is actually facing the same challenges that every state in the country is facing. And the more that I traveled after COVID, as after COVID started, the more cities I saw, the more I realized that like, I mean, the homeless problem is everywhere. The drug problem is everywhere. The education problem and the transportation problem and the public sanitation problem, I've not seen a single city that, that isn't struggling in some way. Um, probably some cities are not struggling quite as much as you know San Francisco. It's like an especially dumb government, but they're, they're all pretty bad and they're all squandering a lot of resources. Um, and I think that, that that's, those are the challenges that people are gonna have to face. In, in, I mean, you can't speak obviously to the cities, but, uh, but I think the cities are gonna have to, they're, they're gonna have the same challenges and they're gonna have to do something about it. And just, just to add to that, which Mike makes up a great point, when we're talking about education, for example, infrastructure, we we're, we're have about 1,000 to 1,400 people moving to the state of Florida a day, and that number continued to increase. A year ago, it was 1,000 people a day. Now we're up to close to 1,400 people a day. And some people say, man, that's great. We're doing the right thing. People want to come to Florida. And then other people say, holy crap, what the hell are we going to do with all these people? Um, so obviously, the resources start to get spread out amongst more people. Um, when we're talking about education, K through 12 education, we spoke about higher education for a little bit, but K through 12 education, uh, we're top 20 in the entire country as far as funding is concerned. And that is with a budget of a little under 110 million in comparison to over 200 in California. California's in the bottom seven in the entire country when we're talking about education funding for K through 12. When you start adding all of those little dots, like you just said, uh, you're right, it's not just the, the tax climate, it's everything across the board. Is everything perfect? Absolutely not. Is there a homeless problem? Yes, there is. Um, the city of Miami, uh, I know, had, had tried to, to tackle that in the last couple months. I don't think that they were successful in doing so, but I know that they were attempting to do that. Uh, but it is really across the board. This is not just a tax climate. I absolutely agree. But I, I do think amongst all of them, if you put them all on a board, um, we're, we're trending in the right direction in, com in comparison to the rest of the states in the country. I, I would say, like, one, it's interesting on the growth being posing challenges. Obviously, you always want to be growing, and Florida's killing it in that respect. But uh, one problem I've noticed is, like, just the cost of housing. How are you guys thinking about that? So uh, workforce housing, super important. Affordable housing, very important. We have in the last two years, we have put more funds into workforce housing and affordable housing than we have in the last four here in Florida. When you're talking about the medium price of a home in Florida, it's at about $440,000. That's a ton of money. That's a ton of money. But it's not a ton of money when you're comparing, comparing it to California, which is over $800,000. Right now, the medium household in California is over $800,000. Uh, so we're about half. We're about half, but you also get 
probably double uh, of what you would have in your pocket if you were if you were in Florida in comparison to, to California. So what we're doing is we're making sure that we can put the necessary funds. We have what's called the Sadowski Trust Fund, um, which is a, a pool of money that is within the budget of uh, the legislature where we fund workforce housing and affordable housing. And, and we continue to increase that amount uh, every single year. We've actually, this last year under Speaker Sprouse, we were able to uh, solidify the formula to make sure that that trust fund doesn't get raided because many times what, what happens is some of the money from the trust fund is used for other purposes. We have a hurricane, we have COVID, and money has to be used. We'll, we'll use some of that money for some of the recoveries of, of, of natural disasters that happen here in Florida. We've been able to solidify that formula to make sure that we say, hey, this is such a big deal uh, because someone who from Miami, say goes to law school, the University of Miami, gets out, gets their first job, is making $80,000 at their first law firm, cannot afford to buy a one bedroom apartment. That's just not gonna happen. It just can't today. Uh, so we put money into this program to allow people that wanna work here in Miami, stay here. And even more so, and then we'll move on from this, because this, this is an important one. We, we just passed what's called the Hometown Heroes Project. And, and here's what it is, it's $100 million that we had put for, for people like firefighters, teachers, nurses, first responders to have an assistant in, uh, in, in their down payment of their first home. Because why? They're graduating, they have student debt, they're not able to, to afford much of that, so we're gonna assist them in, in putting down that down payment so that they can stay in Miami. We wanna keep the talent here. I don't wanna lose our talent. I think we have the best talent in the whole world. I just wanna make sure they stay in the state of Florida and I think our policies allow that. So, I, Mike, I want to read you a tweet from Mark Andreessen. He, was, he had this like thread where he was explaining why he has chosen to stay in California. And as someone who has made the journey from California to Florida, I want to hear how this resonates with you. He said, we rationalize our decision as choosing to live in the ruins of a once great civilization. Like Rome in maybe 250 AD, we live amidst an enormous flowering of culture and creativity, but the roads are becoming unsafe and nobody is quite sure why. Does that yeah. resonate with you? <laughs> yeah, it really does. I think that sitting in my apartment in the summer of 2020, it was the summer when rioting was legalized. Um, I remember like you sort of look around and you think, what? happened like this is this is this feels bad like this is I had, I had a friend pretty liberal friend we were driving through the city not too long ago we were looking at properties for uh, events we were going to throw and uh we were in the tenderloin and she was like if you just transported someone from the future to this moment in time from like you know 100 years ago in america and they just looked around they would be like what war did we lose it's what that's what it looks like and um and so i understand he's I don't understand quite in that tweet how he's expressing why he's, why he's, I think he's right about the problem. I don't know why he's staying. I f would want to stay to sort of stand against that. You know, you, you have to do something. The reason everything collapsed, I wrote this piece, Extract or Die, about two years ago, where I tackled the idea that people leaving was some form of extraction of wealth. It was like the people were the wealth. The people in the region were what made the region so great. Um, and you can't just expect them, you can't treat them like oil or a resource, and they don't belong to the land. They're gonna go where their lives are safe and they can prosper. Um, you don't have a right to any other person. Uh, but in that piece, I did, criticize tech people a bit, and I was kind of critiquing myself in there. I was thinking about how I didn't even know what the Board of Supervisors was for the first five years that I lived in San Francisco. I didn't understand how the government worked. I didn't know who was in charge. Um, people are gonna have to do something, and San Francisco felt like a good enough place as any to make a stand. I moved to Miami because I fell in love in Miami, um, but I see, I just, I really hope that people in, in Florida, who are moving to Florida, obviously you're working in Florida and trying to make the state, you know, great. I hope the people who are moving to Florida are going to participate in local politics and actually be a part of, of, the, of the change here because Mark is maybe choosing to live in California because there's no other really slam dunk alternative to any city. Like, there, there are better cities than other. I mean, Detroit seems really bad. Um, wouldn't want to live there. Chicago seems a lot worse than New York. But, like, they all, are, they all have serious issues, and they're getting worse. And it does feel like the country, like something in the, civic, the civics of the country are, are sort of rotten, and people are going to have to stand and, first of all, acknowledge that and then t treat it as a serious problem. Local politics is not sexy at all. No one ever wants to talk about it. It just is it's boring. Like, it doesn't even give you a lot of status if you're in, uh, like, the really sort of niche, like you're on the board of whatever, it, you know, even education. But it turns out, as I certainly learned over COVID, when you have, you know, 10 crazy people on the board of education, it ruins the entire city. So you do have to, to care about that stuff. And I hope across the board, people will start to care. So you had, you know, the example from the San Francisco 
Board of Education and how you had the backlash against that uh, at the ballot box. But at the same time here in Florida, there's been some controversy over the last year or so around things like what the curriculum will look like in schools here. And there's no doubt that California is a more sort of socially progressive place, at least in terms of its state level politics, while Florida is more of a purple state, a uh, little bit more socially centrist. Uh, to what extent, Danny, is it a concern at all for Florida that Florida might struggle to attract as much tech talent because of that sort of more centrist to conservative leaning sort of social culture or approach? I don't think it should, uh, whether it will or not, Lord knows, but I definitely don't think it should. I, I hate putting labels on, on things when we're talking about uh, like Republicans or Democrats or conservatives or liberals or progressives or, uh, because really what we're doing here in Florida when it comes to the education system, and this is an important thing for people to understand, what we're trying to do is we're not trying to make our children more conservative or less conservative. We're, we're truly just trying to put the power of the children into their parents. That, that, it is literally that simple. You know, we just passed a bill this last year uh, and it was a parental rights bill, which basically just said if you're from kindergarten to third grade you have to have an age-appropriate curriculum it was that simple the left-leaning media has picked up this bill thrown it out they did a successful job of advertising and marketing it and made it seem as though every single Republican that ever lived in the in, in the history of Florida was anti-LGBT that just wasn't true there was no part of that in, in the bill we just wanted to make sure that parents understood the curriculum that was happening in the classroom where they were dropping off their child between kindergarten and third grade that's it and so what we've done, to your point, Mike, is uh, we, we do get involved in local politics. I, I, get in board and, I get involved in the school board races. Our school board, we just changed the entire makeup of that school board. It, it was extremely left-leaning. It is now more towards the middle, the way it should be. You don't want anything too far left, and you don't want anything too far right. Uh, so I do think local politics is, is very important. Um, but when we're talking about the curriculum and the future of our children here in Florida, we will always be on the side of the parents um, a, a, as opposed to the side of the school board, and that's what's been happening here in the last 12 months. Mike? I, I don't think... Um, on the tech, I'm going to answer the tech piece specifically. I, I really don't think the politics of any state matters quite so much to the average tech person. I think that um, mostly what tech people, there is a small minority of people who are very crazy in that who work in tech, who then there's like a sort of small group in every major company. They're like this sort of professional in-house group of activists that for some reason haven't been fired yet. And they cause a lot of problems and, and you don't want them. So if they're the only, that's the only, it's a very small group of people. They're the only people who probably wouldn't move to a state like Florida because it's too conservative. Um, most people didn't move to California because it was liberal and most of the tech talent is moving to California, like all across the country, right? That's where they're moving to San Francisco historically. Um, um, to a lesser, of far lesser extent, places like New York and Boston, uh, they're going there because there are other tech people there. That's why. That's all it is. There, people are just going to go to where the other people are who are doing cool things. And and so at the end of the day, like politics aside, all that matters for Florida is are a lot of people here doing really cool things? Are they building cool things? Can you see yourself? you know, coming here and meeting other nerds who are building weird shit and like, that's it, that's what you need. And if you have that, you're good to go and no one's gonna care about the Florida education bill or anything else. I think Mike just called himself a nerd building really cool shit. <laughs> I imagine how I many of you in this room would also use that label to apply to yourselves? Uh, so I wanna then ask about a state that we haven't talked about yet, which is Texas. Uh, I remember, you know, South by Southwest has been there for so long and, and, you know, went there 10 years ago and there was all this buzz that like Austin was going to be the great magnet that was going to draw all of this talent away from Silicon Valley and be the new thing. And it's good enough for Elon Musk, but it's not yet clear to me that it has really taken on Silicon Valley full on. What are the lessons that can be learned from Texas about what Florida should or shouldn't do to compete with Silicon Valley? Well, I think the really good thing that's happening in Texas is you have a lot of companies, like huge tech companies that have offices in Austin. And that's where a lot of the talent can be drawn from. Um, I think that Texas is great. I think that Austin's great. I don't believe that there's going to be, like, I don't really believe in sort of like a Miami versus Austin thing or what. I think they're both great. I think they're both going to be great. Um, I'm happy for them both. Uh, I think there are going to be a lot of, there will probably be more cities like this in, in the country. I don't know if there'll be a lot of them, but there'll be a handful of, of like, sort of pools of talent. Um, I think that there aren't really any lessons t to learn. I think they're actually, we're both at the early stages. What happened in Austin was sort of an accident. It's like, you basically had, I mean, my read of it, and I'm, I, someone can, I'm sure, tell me I'm wrong, but like my view is that South by Southwest existed there. 
tech people would go there every year. They were like, wow, Austin's cool. Like, maybe I should live here. And then as things got increasingly fucked in California, they're like, what about Austin, the only other cool city that I know about? And they just moved there. <laughs> and so, like, then it's like people opened offices there, and you sort of, like, accidentally created, like, San Francisco, too. Uh, it's a much smaller version of it. It already has a lot of the same problems of San Francisco because you have a small, affluent group of people who moved into the city that refuses to build more housing. And so all of the people who live there who made it cool are pissed at tech. Um, you have, like, all, you've imported all of the same cultural problems. You have a, it's like an, another extremely far left government uh, doing, always doing extremely far left crazy, crazy things. Um, I, I don't know that there are any lessons to learn because, again, it's, I feel like it happened by accident. I think a lot of this stuff happens by accident. Yeah, I agree. I've asked that question of those that have moved to Texas, and I say, hey, man, why would you pick uh, Texas? And, and with Jared and, and, and Joe Alonso, I've asked them, I was like, why, why Texas? Why did you guys come to Florida? And they're like, honestly, because we wanted to get the hell out of California, but we still have a lot of people that we care about in California. It was easier to get back to California from Austin than Miami. The flights were just easier. And I was like, uh... Uh, all right. I mean, what do you say to that, right? I mean, yeah, you're right. It is geographically closer to California than, than we are in Miami. Uh, but yeah, I don't see that as a competition. And we have many uh, friends in, in Texas, and they're, they're doing wonderful things. And I hope they continue to prosper as well. I mean, look, uh, I, I think them, them doing well uh, helps Florida as well. So I wouldn't see it as a good competition. Well, you just mentioned something like the distance of a flight from one city to another. I mean, physical place does matter in some ways, or does it? Nowadays, after COVID, remote work becoming so much more prevalent, uh, so many more folks just saying, look, I'm happy to work at my, out of my house. I don't need to be in the same place as everybody at my company or everybody I work with. So to what extent is this whole conversation, California versus Florida, where it's gonna be the big tech hub, to what extent is it even relevant when so much of this can just be done in the cloud? I don't believe in the remote stuff, and I don't believe in the cloud stuff. I, I feel that my friend Balaji would be really mad if he heard me saying all this. I think it's <laughs> n just like not the way that people ex exist. I was alone for you know six months in the early part of COVID. It was the most depressed I ever was in my entire life. Like people want to be with other people, and I think especially, and I've kind of aged out of this group. But but when you're very very young, uh, you are looking to meet. You're, first of all, you're, you're looking to, to find places to work where you can kind of grow, and you're looking for life partners and friendship and romantic, and you want to go to big cities with lots of people who are sort of quasi, like roughly like-minded, um, because that's where you're gonna have your greatest chance of doing both of those things, and especially when it comes to like professional successes in your youth. I think young people kind of intuitively understand this, like you're gonna have a way better chance of learning and growing and getting promotions and finding new opportunities in person every day at the place then you're gonna get you know doing stuff remote. I think the people who love remote work the most tend to be parents uh, of like sort of young parents have like a new family. They tend to be uh, my age and a little bit older, um, and that's a limited that's a limited part of, of of the industry. Those people will exist and they'll have plenty of jobs, but I, there's going to be a huge demand always for in-person work. And those places that are doing lots of in-person work, I think, will be the most successful. Danny, what do you think? How much does place matter? Look, I, uh, place matters to me. I, I'm from Miami, and I'm never leaving this place. Uh, I'm big on culture. My parents left Cuba in 1969. Uh, thankful for the opportunity this country has given me. Thankful for Miami opening their doors and allowing my family to be here and have the opportunity. All we ever asked for was opportunity. Miami gave us that opportunity, and, and we've grown that culture since then. I, I don't think it. I don't think it matters that much. Um, I, I'm with you, Mike. Man, I can't do the remote stuff at all. I, even during COVID, I, even if I was the only guy sitting in, in my desk, I, I have to be in the office. Um, we're, we're a culture here in Miami that likes to see and feel and talk and we're emotional, we're passionate, we like to get into it. It's kind of tough when you're doing that through a Zoom call with a blurred background uh, and you're kind of checked out. I'm not going to lie, I check out within like three or four minutes of a Zoom call. Uh, so it, it doesn't work for me. So I want to talk about the, the policy environment in California and what, if anything, could change to either assert or reestablish California's dominance in this space. Um, Mike, is there anything, understanding that you moved here for reasons not just taxes, um, is there anything from a policy perspective that California could do that would make it a more appealing place to want to go back to? And Danny, the version of that question for you is, what would make you the most concerned? If California legislature passed Bill X, Y, or Z, what would make you the most nervous about them pulling people back? I think if California solves not even California, if, the, if San Francisco and Los Angeles solve crime and housing, it's over for like the rest of the world. The city, the California's too great, the resources are too incredible, the beauty is staggering, the talent pool is insane, the companies are huge, but it's dangerous. There are lots of like, it's like drugs, crime, 
and it's really expensive to live there. So if you can figure out the crime stuff, and it seems like people are roughly on the path to do that, and you can figure out, figure out the housing stuff, and that seems like a, a way tougher nut to crack in California, um, th that, that would be it. I, I'll speak on my own behalf, but I, I feel fairly confident uh, that the rest of my colleagues would feel the same way. If California got on their, on their sweet jet, they'd get over here, uh, they'd sit with us and they would say, how did you do it? Give me the entire playbook. I would open up the playbook and I would show them every single piece of policy that we have passed that, that, that has led us to where we are today as a state of Florida. I would love for California to be like Florida. I don't think them tr changing their political trajectory towards a more Florida approach is bad for Florida. It's great for the country. We love competition. We're not running from it. We're not scared of talent. We're not, we're not scared to get into a, a, a debate on which state is better. Uh, if the other state, i.e. Texas, is doing a lot of the same policies that we are, we don't have a beef with Texas. We love that Texas is doing the right thing. I would love for California to do it. I don't, personally, I don't, I don't see it as a negative at all. Uh, but I also know that that's not going to happen. I mean, I just, they, what is it? They, they banned the gas-powered cars in the next, like, 10 years, uh, all natural gases in the next, like, 20. I mean, I don't, I don't see how that can even happen. The, it, there, it's so, the policy is so, like, inbred into the politics of California that I don't see how they will ever change, and that's unfortunate. I, I wish they would, and if, look, my cell phone's been the same since I was 15 years old. If they call me, I'll tell them exactly how to do it. It, it works. Florida works. It worked for Mike to get over here in Delian, which, by the way, real quick, not with the question, but way too often here in Florida, and I haven't had a platform to say it, but I think this is the perfect one. Uh, elected officials across the board get so much credit for this, this movement from California uh, to Florida. And, and yes, uh, the climate is great, the policies we pass are important, but none of that means anything if, if people like Mike aren't willing to take the chance jump across the entire country and, and invest their future into the state of Florida, regardless of what city or county it is. Um, so on behalf of all of Florida, thank you to you. To, I sat with Delian the other day uh, for lunch and I told him the same thing. I'm like, man, thanks for taking a chance because I'm not sure that I would have had the courage to do so and you guys doing that is, that's what the real movement is. The movement isn't politicians and all that other crap. It's these guys who've actually believed in it, said, fuck it, I'm all in. They jumped on a plane and they came over here with their t-shirts and cool sneakers. They did it. And that, uh, <laughs> Thank you very much. And I think that, that that's the main thing I think, and it's the, a really powerful thing that Florida has is this just openness. It can't, I can't explain what it's like living in a place where you know, you're working really hard and you're providing a lot of value and you love where you are and the sort of entire structure, the institutional structure around you, the government sort of structure around you and, and even the culture of it is sort of like, we hate you <laughs> for all of this. That's like a very, it's a weird, it's a weird, it's a weird thing to, to exist inside of. Um, and, uh, and it really hasn't taken much, honestly, because everyone has like, been psychologically abused in California for so long um, to feel enamored of like, yeah, but it, it means a lot to be like not hated just for <laughs> moving here. Well, I wanna, uh, I, it may be a little early for me to be doing this, but I'd love to open it up for some questions. I've got someone from the Lincoln team who's supposed to be helping me to moderate some of this. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, I would love to hear from the audience because so many of you have either made this journey from, from California to Florida or you're from here in Florida. Um, so I'll, I'll turn it over to Brandon to get some questions going. What's it gonna take to have a policy that's pro-crypto, uh, pro-crypto companies here similar to Wyoming? Um, just cause like I have, a, all my companies are based in Wyoming um, and it, really would love to help them move here, but legislation isn't friendly for the things that I want to do. I'll, I'll take that. Uh, Alejandro, it's, it's great to see you again. Um, I, I met Alejandro yesterday at, at a reception, and I said, hey man, I, I uh, don't know much about you, I don't know what you do, but you have the sweetest head of hair I've ever seen. Uh, so it's good to see, to see you and your locks of love uh, uh, again. Um, so, you know, I, uh, I'm trying to learn more about, about the crypto space, about the tech space, uh, and I ask that question all the time. I've heard that Wyoming has the perfect blueprint. Can we do it in Florida? Uh, yes, absolutely, we, we can. Um, is some of that gonna happen? We've already started. We passed our first piece of legislation under Representative Vance Lupus last year uh, here in Florida. It kinda got, got caught in the wind, but uh, I think we will be at it again. But here's the interesting thing, and I would love to hear your perspective on it, and uh, we can talk about it after this, but I have asked that question, let's say to 10 people. Half will say, man, Wyoming is perfect. If you can do what Wyoming does, it'd be great for us. The other half 
will say, if I ask them, what can I do to make Florida, I mean the crypto capital of the world? And they would say, very simply, they would say, stay the hell out of our space. And so it's a battle of stay out, don't pass anything, uh, because we want to be able to, to just do our own thing without regulation and government getting in the way. And then the other half saying, do what Wyoming's doing. Uh, is there a blend in the middle? That's for experts like, like, like you, Alejandro, to, to, to opine on with people like myself and say, hey, this is the perfect mix. We're open to it in the state of Florida. This is not something where we haven't wanted to do it. People are opposed to the legislation in Wyoming. I would say quite, quite the opposite. It's more of having those conversations with people. And it's why I'm trying to, to be here on behalf of really the state. Uh, you see a lot of the, the local politicians, but on the state, not so much. And this is kind of that open door policy where it's like, hey, man, Talk to us. I mean, you're sitting in front of, of two state legislators right now, state legislators right now, uh, and in Alex Andrade from the Panhandle, he's kind of one of those tech guys for us. He kind of leads that policy. So I would tell you, exchange the information with Alex and let, let, let's get moving. Um, we're open to it. Remote work, overrated or underrated? I hate it. This, that's all I've got. I think it's terrible. I think. Um, especially for startups, I think it's impossible. I think it's silly to even pretend that you can do remote work as a startup. I think as you mature as a company, like in tech, I don't know what it's like in the rest of American industry, but in tech, it's very obvious that the companies that are able to do remote work are just runaway monopolies that have lots of money, and it's like you have a lot of people who weren't doing anything before COVID. You're going to have a lot of people who aren't doing anything after COVID. Uh, people who work remote, they work less. It's just like I think it's silly when we pretend that's not true, um, and I think it's bad for the culture of the company personally. That's how I personally feel. You go ahead. Uh, Will? Yeah. yeah, that's what I thought. Uh, good to see you again, man. Um, n no, I, um, I, I'm against it for me personally and for my company. Uh, we like to see you know, your butt in the chair. Uh, we think it, it, it brings, brings better work product. But for some people, it might work. For, their, for some people, maybe they cut their overhead costs and it's something where there's no human interaction to begin with. As a, as a business guy, I don't see how that works. I, I think no matter what, I like to, to be able to see the person. Uh, but I don't want to. I don't want to limit that opportunity for someone if they think that's the best model for their business. Uh, you know, kind of that's the, the Florida way. You know, if it's best for you, man, go for it. I don't want to get in your way. For me personally, just as Danny Perez, no, I'm, I'm not a big fan. The remote work question for me raises. Uh, you know, I asked you about to what extent does place matter and Miami versus Austin versus San Francisco, but what about this globally? I mean, there's plenty of talent all around the world. So, from either of your perspectives, uh, to what extent is the the United States still, like, can you ever imagine somewhere else in the world becoming as innovative as what we have here well, in the United States? There are a lot of, the remote has, has had a huge impact on the talent pool, just in, so as things got really, really, really expensive in San Francisco, even before COVID, you started seeing for the first time, not only did you start seeing a lot of remote work for sort of uh, engineers in South America, or even like Ukraine or, or India, um, you start to see like a sort of acceptance of that from venture capitalists just in terms of like the, the it was just too expensive and you couldn't possibly expect someone to hire you know five engineers and and not be at least open to some sort of version of a little bit of remote work abroad um that's going to persist and it's gotten only you've seen that trend sort of grow uh it, but it's never it's i don't see a lot of people building their entire teams out where i saw that was back in like 2016 i went to uh Web Summit in Lisbon, and I met a bunch of Europeans building companies, they all did this. Everyone there was like, oh yeah, my entire tech team is in Ukraine. All of them. So I went to Ukraine, I was like, wow, why am I here? I should go to Ukraine. Um, and that was just like a sort of sad, like, like I was like, oh, it's like very, that's a whole other story. Um, but I think that because of that, you'll see, you'll see little tech hubs um, in South America, and, uh, and certainly they already exist. Um, but I, I still think the, the together thing for startups will persist. All right, let's go to the next question. Well, I guess on a somewhat related note, um, there's been a lot of talk about companies moving and unable to find the talent. Not a lot about talent moving to Florida and unable to find the companies. And with all this talk uh, from various panelists and people about not liking remote work, wanting to move away from remote work, how do we resolve that catch-22 that keeps people in California? Uh, well, what I see is people just bringing people out. I mean, I, I don't think, it, I think you're right. That, that, that I don't think there are a lot of engineers who are moving here for all of the opportunities. I think it's more like there are companies that are building companies here and then they're, they're like bringing talent from, from outside, specifically engineering talent is, is, the, is the, the problem. 
Um, but I mean, people are doing it, and I think it's just like you. What you really need is is one huge successful company in Miami, and that's enough to uh, you could, from that one company you could have an entire tech ecosystem around that. Uh, and it just will take time, and it is. It, it's it's definitely happening. It's on that trajectory, but um, yeah, it is what it is. You, gotta, you have to build a company first, and that requires re recruiting in different cities and bringing them in, and that and that has been happening, and people have been succeeding at it. This will be the last question. Hey, thank you. I wanted to ask about a policy question. So California arguably is the tech powerhouse it is because non-competes aren't enforceable. The first tech company in California, uh, Shockley Semiconductors, very bad company. The guy who founded it became a eugenicist, stopped making semiconductors, went around the world offering his Nobel Prize money, money to women of color to get sterilized. His employees hated him. They were all able to quit their jobs and start a company called Fairchild. Their top eight employees were able to quit and start a company called Intel the non-competes weren't enforceable against them. Here in Florida, non-competes are. So this could be a place where good ideas go to die. Because if you're a good employee who goes to work for a bad boss, you can't quit your job and work in that field for three more years. Will Florida be a place where good ideas go to die or a place where good workers and good ideas can chase each other? Yeah, so that's uh, well, nice to meet you. And that, that's a common question that we receive uh, here. First of all, non-competes, and this is really not policy, this is more, more case law. Uh, but no, non-competes here do have a limitation. You can't have a com uh, non-compete for 10 years, quite frankly, not even five. Usually it's about three. Uh, and you can't have a non-compete for the entire state of Florida. It's usually a radius of a certain amount of miles. Uh, it, case loss is probably somewhere around 10 miles. Uh, that is just standard for now. But the problem with uh, passing legislation, and so let's talk the policy for a second. The problem with passing legislation that says you as a private company cannot negotiate uh, an NDA, uh, excuse me, or a non-compete uh, with your employee, all we're doing is taking away a, a, a tool for the negotiation tactic. If you as an employee do not want to sign a non-compete, then I would, I would recommend that that is, not a, that is not the place for you. If that is so important to the person that is trying to hire you. And the inverse, if you're the person that is hiring this employee because he, is, he or she is so talented, um, and what is important to them is not having a non-compete or having it limited to two miles in one year. That's something that we negotiate on a daily basis. We kind of don't want to take away tools for a, an institution or a company to negotiate in comparison to, to the, the individual or the potential employee. I hear you. I hear you loud and clear. I know exactly what, what, what the issue is. Uh, but, but in Florida, uh, it's something that we usually uh, don't try and do when it's like limit the, the tactic of negotiation. And I know that that was a big deal in California. It's actually one of the more common questions that I get, b believe it or not, because people believe that that is what will open the floodgates in Florida. If you take away the ability to, to sign those non-competes, people will be more open to moving in, into Florida. Is it a possibility or is it never gonna happen? It, it, we've never had anything like that move through the legislature, so it's hard to, co to compare it, but those are the pros and cons that are spoken about internally when that question is asked, which is a, a very common question. Well, I wanna thank you all so much for your great questions. Thank you to the panelists for having such wonderful things to say thank and you. helping us to resolve this debate, California versus Florida.